Hello there, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan, and once again, it is Star Wars time, which is usually my favorite time of the year. In this video, there will be some minor spoilers and visuals from the first two episodes of the Ahsoka series. That's out right now. So my first take about the Ahsoka series, I honestly felt like I was watching Rebels 2.0, except that the visuals were live action and absolutely gorgeous. I still can't get over how beautiful the rendering of ships are in the new Disney shows. Mando had some real stunners, Andor did as well. I mean, Kenobi for some reason really dropped the ball with their models. But Ahsoka picks it right back up. The visual cues here are all classic Star Wars and things look gorgeous. I mean, Lothal City looks almost like Alderaan, which is a far cry from where we left it at the beginning of the Galactic Civil War at the end of the Rebels series. I guess all you really need is a bit of peace and stability and wealth comes flowing out, huh? Anyway, clearly the people on Lothal are having a much better time now than they did during the war. And as far as the first two episodes go, I think it's really just too early to judge whether Dave Filoni's first attempt at soloing a live-action series will be successful or not. I'd have to say the first two episodes were exactly what I would expect from Filoni. Um, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of Filoni. I'm more of an Andor kind of fan at this point. But um, I'm still rooting for him. I think he can really pull this off. There's some really interesting story elements being developed in the background of this series that I want to see played out. Now, in our previous video, I wanted to introduce to fans who might have never seen Rubbles, the main droid buddy for this series, Chopper. He's always been one of the more interesting droids in the franchise. He's basically developed some extreme PTSD from all the crazy stuff he experienced in the Clone Wars and the Galactic Civil War. This guy is basically a walking PSA for why droids need their routine memory wipes. As much as I love Harrison Dula as a character, she really dropped the ball on this. She's kind of complicit in all of Chopper's, you know, genocidal and murderous acts. Now, speaking of, you know, creating huge amounts of chaos and death and destruction. There is another. That person is Sabine Wren, the Padawan of Ahsoka Tano and the central character in this series, it seems. And she has a history herself and a kill count that might be even higher than Chopper's. Now, just to be clear, she's not a remorseless psychopath like Chopper, but nonetheless, the damage she does is just as terrifying. And I think Ahsoka Tano, who's really falling into her mentor role really well, explains it the best with this quote here. Sometimes even the right reasons have the wrong consequences. Keep that quote in mind as we go throughout this video because it's very important. It might be just one of the major themes of this entire series. It's easy for people who don't know Sabian Wren to just dismiss her as some snotty purple-haired punk who's so self-absorbed in her own rubble image that she can't even see the bigger picture and her responsibility to the galaxy. This kind of reminds me actually of Ahsoka Tano when she was first introduced to us in the Clone Wars series before she had her really long character arc where we as fans started to respect her. And in Sabine Run's case, uh, you know, appearances are kind of misleading. The truth is always a bit more complicated. Is the Zabian Ren has always had her heart in the right place and not in the wrong place because she'd be dead from the saber wound. But despite her best efforts, her best intentions, things always go sideways and end up in massive amounts of death and destruction. As you'll see, she's a tragic hero in her own life story. And so while that scene of her escaping on a speeder from that event commemorating the Battle of Lothal seemed like just another tired and cliche act of rebellion, awesome seeing Clancy Brown reprise his role as Governor Ryder Azadi, by the way, it really isn't. You see, Sabine Wren isn't just running out of fear of social engagement or a lack of appreciation or just because she wants to be different. She doesn't want to be there because she doesn't want to accept that recognition. She doesn't see herself in a very favorable light. This has always been Sabian Wren's character. She's one of the only Mandalorians aside from Din Djarin to ever freely give up the Darksaber. She felt unworthy back then and I think she still feels unworthy at this point in her story. And now that I think about it, while Ezra, Ahsoka, and even Hera Syndulla had their own character arcs and were able to mature and fulfill their full potential, Sabine Wren never grew and finished developing in the Rebel series. She had moments where she stepped up and tried to take responsibility, but it almost never worked out for her. Which is probably why it's finally time for her to shine in this story. But enough speculating about what will happen, let's talk about what's already happened in her very tragic life. Sabine Wren was born on the world of Mandalore in 21 BBY to Ulrich and Ursa Wren of Clan Wren, who were politically affiliated with House Vizsla. Since the year was 21 BBY, Sabine would have been born in an age of openness and reform in Mandalorian society thanks to the new Mandalorian's political faction. 
But the new Mandalorian's pacifist mentality made them extremely vulnerable to outside influence and chaos during the Clone Wars, which just started a year before Sabine's birth. The new Mandalorians would ultimately collapse. This would lead to a great deal of instability, which most likely affected Sabine's childhood greatly. Sabine Wren's mother, Ursa, was a brilliant warrior, and she joined the Death Watch when she was quite young. Just like her daughter when she was young, Ursa believed that Mandalore could be saved through tradition and strength. But unfortunately, the Death Watch, like most reactionary movements, had no answer only regression. Paz Vizzle, the leader of Death Watch, would be killed in an honor duel by the criminal and former Sith Lord Maul. A small faction of Death Watch soldiers led by Bo-Katan who refused to bend knee to the Death Miri warlord. Bo-Katan would return to the throne of Mandalore for a short period of time with the help of the Republic and Ahsoka Tano at the end of the Clone Wars, but she would soon be betrayed by the Republic when it turned into the Empire. Ursa Ren, as the matriarch of her clan, wanted to protect her people, her family. This included Sabine and her brother Tristan, and so she would bend knee to the Imperial occupiers on Mandalore. It's difficult to be a regent for an occupying force you despise, but Ursa made the choice she thought was right, and believed that resistance would be futile. The side effect of this was that Sabine Wren and Tristan would join up with the Imperial Academy and go through the standard Imperial brainwashing process. Sabian Wren was an extremely gifted student. She was very adept with all things mechanical. She was also extremely creative thanks to her artist father. All of this would serve the Empire well. Sabian would end up inventing a weapon known as the Arc Pulse Generator. This was a super weapon that could be programmed to target specific materials at the atomic level and essentially disintegrate them with a pulse. Sabian would actually tune this machine to target Beskar, the prized material from which all Mandalorians made their armor with. Sabian would turn the Mandalorian's great greatest strength into their greatest weakness. Her invention was seen as an abomination, and her name would forever be tainted amongst her people because she invented this doomsday device. I think this is one of the main reasons why Sabine is living alone on the planet of Lothal, away from her people. Now, Sabine would eventually realize that the empire she was aiding was actually subjugating her people and brutalizing them. And to her horror, she also realized that her death machine was killing a lot of people. I built weapons, terrible weapons, but the Empire used them on Mandalore, on friends, on family. It's at this point that Sabi and Ren would tuck her tail in and just run, or at least that's what the Mandalorian people thought. You ran from the Empire, you ran from your family. Lies. So what's the truth? The truth is actually quite sad. She was just a child. She was being exploited by the Empire like so many other children before her, and she was placed in an almost impossible situation. I wanted to stop it. I had to stop it. I spoke out when I did. My family didn't stand with me. They chose the Empire. They left me. Sabi Wren was hardly in her teens when her entire family abandoned her, or so she thought. The real situation was a bit more complicated. You see, the Galactic Empire and their Mandalorian allies had the Wren family in a vice. The truth was her family never stopped loving her. Ursa Wren was just forced to make a terrible decision in order to protect as many people as she could. Something that Sabi Wren doesn't really understand until she returns to Mandalore for the first time. Bean, when you ran away, it saved you. Don't you understand? Coming back here has put you in danger. Sabine's father was being held by the Saxons as a political prisoner, and her brother Tristan was assigned to Saxon super commandos, and he was desperately trying to do everything to win his family's honor back. But when you left, the other clans turned their backs on us. We lost everything! Our power in the capital, our respect, and our honor. If I can restore our family's name, if I can protect father, then I have to try! As I said when I mentioned that quote before from Ahsoka, this is really the theme of Sabine's life. Even though she's made the right choices from a morality perspective, Sabine's actions resulted in great suffering for everyone, for herself, for her family. And now, Sabine Wren, in these scenes I'm showing you, has finally chosen to return back to Mandalore because she can no longer ignore that fight she, you know, dropped so many years ago. It was impossible for her to ignore her responsibility. You see, she and her rebel friends had found the Darksaber, the symbol of Mandalorian leadership, and now her allies, 
Fen'ra and the Jedi, the Rebels, they all wanted her to use the Darksaber to unite the Mandalorian people. Maul used it to divide and conquer our people. You can wield it to do the opposite. Wield it? You're crazy! Kanan, tell him he's crazy. Consider what he has to say. What? So that she can create a powerful Mandalorian army that could be allied with the Rebel Alliance. I think Luther and Rael would approve of such measures. Yes, the rebel cause was just and the Empire was brutal and needed to be taken down, but clearly Sabine Wren never wanted this fight. But she gets pressured into taking on this fight anyway by people she trusted. The sheer amount of courage and perseverance she needs to delve back into this dark chapter of her life is impressive. This might be why, you know, Sabine is worthy to be Ahsoka's apprentice. But upon Sabine's return, things get even worse. First, Ursa Wren secretly contacts Gar Saxon, a former Death Watch comrade, when her daughter arrives. She hopes to deliver the Jedi to Gar Saxon and the Empire, and in exchange, get more political power and perhaps a pardon for her daughter. I mean, Mandalorians like Ursa Wren, especially former Death Watch members, really did not like the Jedi. But she was foolish to trust Gar Saxon. Why count as you are harboring rebels here? Clan Wren is clearly a threat to the Empire, and must be made an example of. I think Sabi and Wren up until this point never realized just how much of a burden she placed on her family's shoulders by leaving. It doesn't have to be this way. We are all Mandalorians. I've been fair to you, Tristan, and you have served me well. I'll give you a choice. Stand with me, or die with your family. I choose family. Then Clan Wren ends here. But the truth is, had Clan Wren rebelled when Sabine was a teenager, they probably would have been crushed. But this time around, Sabine and the rebels managed to defeat Gar Saxon, and Sabine takes the Darksaber back, which means she rightfully wins the weapon and can claim it for herself, along with the Mandalorian throne. The Mandalorian rebels have won the first battle, and soon after, the rebels would join forces with Bo-Katan and her night owls, who have been waiting in exile ever since the end of the Clone Wars. Sabine gives up the Darksaber to Bo-Katan, gladly passing on this responsibility she never wanted. And together, they manage to wipe out the Saxon clan and retake Mandalore. Sabine even manages to track down her arc reactor superweapon that she created, but not after it turns several Mandalorians into ash. Sabine Wren would eventually retool the weapon and use it to target just plastoid armor, killing every stormtrooper in the vicinity of the weapon. It's a pretty gruesome death. But victory would be short-lived. Ursa Wren's more cautious approach would ultimately prove to be the more reasonable and better option. Bo-Katan and Sabine's victory would convince the Empire that Mandalore could never be controlled, and so they launched a massive aerial assault on the planet known as the Great Purge of Mandalore. Even with all of Mandalore's remaining houses gathered together, they never really stood a chance against the massive empire. They simply had too large of a navy. It was a complete massacre. The surface was thoroughly bombarded twice. All outbound ships from Mandalore were shot down, and ground forces would sweep the entire planet for survivors shortly after. The Mandalorian people, including the brightest and youngest recruits, were completely wiped out along with Sundari City's iconic dome. The Mandalorians ceased being a people after that moment and were scattered across the galaxy once again. The blame of this great disaster was laid on Bo-Katan Cries, but one could also make a strong argument that it was Sabian Wren who returned and kicked off this series of events that forced the Mandalorians to prematurely execute their plan to retake the planet in the first place. Had the Mandalorians waited just a few more years for the Empire to weaken and the Rebels to strengthen, then the Great Purge would have never happened. Others blame Sabian Wren for giving Bo-Katan the Darksaber. Some believe that this decision cursed Bo-Katan's rule and made it illegitimate, which led to Mandalore's greatest defeat. And so this is the Sabian Wren we all see now in Ahsoka, a girl who is perhaps frightened by her own abilities. A girl who is just disheartened by the fact that everywhere she goes, death seems to stalk her. It was Sabine who suggested to the Rebels that they scout out the Concord Dawn system for a new hyperspace route to Lothal. This would lead to the destruction of the ancient Mandalorian Protectors group. It was Sabine in the gunner's spot when the new B-Wing prototype was used against an Imperial light cruiser, killing all personnel on board. It was also Sabine who helped destroy another Imperial light cruiser over the planet of Ryloth with an explosive-laden TIE bomber. It was Sabine Wren who ultimately pushed the button that detonated the explosives on the Lothal Imperial Complex. 
which held tens if not hundreds of thousands of Imperials, including many non-combatants, clerical and administrative staff, young cadets, perhaps even family members of Imperial personnel. Sure, many grunts have blood on their hands after they return from war, but Sabine Wren is completely drenched in this stuff. No wonder she wants nothing to do with Ahsoka or the New Republic's plan. It's only her loyalty to Ezra Bridger, the Jedi who risked his life to save everyone in La Fall, that makes this journey worth it again. One can only hope that history does not repeat itself for Sabine.